Welcome to Living History UK. My name's Steve Davis and this is the British Soldier of May 1940. In late May, early June 1940, the BEF, or British Expeditionary Force as it was known, found itself surrounded at Dunkirk. Their only hope was to be evacuated back to Britain by the Navy. The Germans had rolled into France in April and encircled the BEF by utilising their fast-paced, armour-focused blitzkrieg tactics. So the uniform that was worn by most regulars at Dunkirk, and I say most regulars because the uniform was still very new. Many of the troops in the run up to Dunkirk were still wearing service dress, which essentially is the same uniform as the First World War. However, in 1937, battle dress surge was introduced to the British Army. And this here you can see is the blouse. It's a very high waisted garment, and it's made of wool surge material. When it was introduced it was actually modelled on a 1930s ski suit and it's completely revolutionary, it's well ahead of its time. It was totally practical and actually ended up being in service with the British Army right into the 1960s. So it's interesting to note at this point in the war that sleeve insignia wasn't worn by most troops. The only troops who did wear sleeve insignia were troops from the Guards Division and they wore regimental shoulder titles. The rest of the infantry wore what are called slip-on titles, which are pieces of serge with black embroidery on denoting which regiment or corps they belonged to. Following the withdrawal from Dunkirk, two other models of battle dress were actually introduced to service with the British Army. The 1940 pattern looks exactly the same as battle dress serge, However, you have lining inside the collar, as the battle dress surge first pattern actually has no lining in the collar. It was very itchy and aggravated the men's skin. The second pattern that was introduced during wartime is what's called the austerity pattern, but we'll cover that on a future video. Also introduced at the same time as battle dress was the 1937 pattern web equipment. It was essentially a copy of the 1919 pattern naval web equipment but it was mixed with some elements of 08 web equipment also. And it saw use with the British and Commonwealth forces well until after the war. So there's a couple of noticeable differences between the webbing used by the troops at Dunkirk and the webbing items used in the latter half of the war. So we're going to cover three pieces specific to the Dunkirk era. So first of all, you'll notice the webbing itself is what's called reduction weave. So the straps are one piece woven uh, webbing essentially, rather than you'll see post Dunkirk, the three pieces of webbing sewn together. And that was all down to production methods and the only real company that could achieve the reduction with webbing method and process was the Mills Equipment Company or Miko as they're called. The second piece that's definitely worth mentioning is the basic pouch and this is the Mark I pouch. The reason why the Mark II was introduced very quickly following the withdrawal from Dunkirk is that when troops were sitting down, the pouches were digging into their thighs. They weren't very practical if you were using vehicles, and of course, it was a very mobile war. It was built around me mechanised warfare, essentially. There is one piece of webbing equipment that is omitted, and that's for very good reason. And that is the entrenching tool, the shovel, as it was called. It saw a very limited lifespan with the British Army, and many of the photos and, and sort of uh, film reels that were taken at the time of Dunkirk show British troops not wearing their entrenching tool. And the reason for that was because the tool sat on the left hip. And as they marched along, the handle of the tool bounced against the leg. And it was very irritating. So troops jettisoned that piece of equipment very quickly. And following the withdrawal from Dunkirk, the original 08 pattern entrenching tool was reintroduced to the British Army with a couple of changes on the webbing pouch so that it could be fitted 
to the 37 pattern web equipment. This is the haversack or small pack as it's also known. You can see on the outside of it is the trusty enamel muck. We've also got underneath the flap the rubberized ground sheet. Inside the haversack would be items such as a pullover, emergency ration tin, cap comforter, mess tins and tommy cooker and also your wash roll as well. The shade of Blanco used on this webbing is what's called number 97 and that was the, the Blanco colour that was used to treat the webbing during the early war Dunkirk period. At Dunkirk all British infantry were armed with the same rifle, the Mark III Lee Enfield short magazine 303. It's a bolt action rifle, it's got a magazine that can hold 10 rounds and it is exactly the same rifle as the British Army used throughout the First World War. One man in each section would also be armed with the Bren light machine gun and then one man per platoon would be armed with the boys anti-tank rifle. Furthermore, one man from each platoon would be armed with a 2 inch mortar. Each rifleman would carry one mills bomb as well as one bandolier which contained 50 rounds and that would be carried rolled up inside a basic pouch. Each rifleman would also carry a Bren magazine loaded with 28 rounds. Each man would also carry the 1907 pattern sword bayonet. The fear and use of gas or chemical weapons being used at the outbreak of the Second World War was significant. For the use of gas during the Great War had been devastating. The government knew that a populace or army ill-equipped would quickly lose morale if attacked by chemical weapons and to that end the average British infantryman was equipped with some specific items to be used against the use of chemicals and gas in the field. The first item we're going to talk about is what's called the respirator haversack which sits on the chest very high up. This is called the alert position. This means that the respirator can be deployed very quickly, should it need to be. Contained in the respirator haversack was of course the respirator, but also some anti-gas eye shields, gas detection brazards, cotton waste and anti-gas ointment. One interesting point that's worth noting on anti-gas equipment is that troops dubbed their boots at this point in the war. And the reason they did that was not just to protect it from water ingress, but moreover to protect the feet from blistering should mustard gas be used. For if mustard gas was used and it affected the skin, the soldiers wouldn't be able to march or walk and they'd become immobile and very quickly go by the wayside as an effective fighting force. Okay, so turning the mannequin around, we can see the gas cape. And this is rolled up, worn on the nape of the neck there's two ties that go around the gas cave and they actually tie through the respirator haversack and not off on the right hand side. When and if there was a gas attack you could pull on those cords and it would drop the gas cape down and the gas cape would cover all your webbing and wrap around all of your kit and it would button up at the front. In 1938 the British Army updated the type of helmets that its soldiers wore. Up until that point they had been using the same helmets which was used in the Great War. And this is the Mark I Star helmet. And to look at it, it's exactly the same helmet as was used during the First World War. However, there is a couple of changes. First of all, the chin strap was updated. This is an elasticated chin strap. And secondly, the liner was updated. This is an original liner. And as you can see, it's leather with an oval crash pad. If you ever see an oval crash pad, that signifies that it's more than likely going to be a very early type of helmet liner. One of the other key changes that was introduced to the helmet was that the rim around the helmet was demagnetised so it wouldn't affect the use of the officer's field compass during field exercises. The withdrawal from Dunkirk, or Operation Dynamo as it was known, was a roaring success 
on well over 300,000 Allied troops were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk and Bray's Dunes. Some troops did remain in France, however, until they were rescued from the ports in Brest in mid to late June 1940. This is known as Operation Ariel, which to me is the forgotten Dunkirk. It would be another four years before British troops would set foot back in Northeast Europe, which of course was D-Day. And by then, much of their equipment have changed. Make sure you tune in for a future video where we'll be covering the kit used and worn by a D-Day soldier. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please do continue to support our Patreon and also our TikTok account as they continue to grow. And remember, you can always donate to us and help support our project by following the PayPal donate link in our bio below. But for now, I've been Steve Davis, and this is Living History UK, over and out.